All right, good morning. We are live on OSHA's ETFs. Apologies for the delayed start here. We had uh, English. Uh, we have today with us a special guest, uh, David Bonson. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Great, great. We're going to get an intro from you in a, in a few minutes. Kevin, uh, good that you us. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. All right. Sound check works. So uh, let's just, the talk today is rising interest rates, dividend, dividend income. Um, David, you have a history of uh, focusing on dividends, dividend quality for your clients. You run a terrific business, Newport Beach and New York City. For clients. Just tell people briefly about you and your business and your investment thesis. Uh, sure. I, I'm the uh, chief investment officer of the Bonson Group, uh, the founder of the business. We were previously inside of Morgan Stanley and migrated out uh, to become an independent business about six years ago. Uh, we manage $2.7 billion, have 29 employees between our two offices, uh, full service wealth management firm, but a very heavy focus in our U.S. equity allocations on dividend growth. Fantastic. Well, we're going to get into some of the topics today. Basically, the yield curve has been pretty sharply recently, uh, and a lot of people who invest want income. They want stability, and so we'll, we'll get some ideas on that. Um, so let's just first talk about the yield curve itself. We have people called by advisors, and we have others who are uh, investors. Um, let me ask our producer just to put up the contact information if you want to reach uh, David Bonson and the Bonson Group. Just cement, please put that up so people see it. Um, and let's just talk about the yield curve for a second here. You know, it's been it's pushed down below 1.0 in the 10 year for a little while, and now it's gone the other way up to one and a half. It's put pressure on equities, put pressure, of course, on bonds. What are your thoughts, David, and what are you doing for clients? Well, I, I don't see a material difference between a 1% tenure and a 1.5% tenure when it comes to income-oriented investors. Uh, people don't want yields with a one-handle when they need cash flow. <laughs> and, and so to me, when people talk about this altering the market multiple, a one to one and a half move in the tenure is not going to do it. Now, perhaps on the margin for really expensive PE stocks, particularly large cap growth, uh, out that really rely on multiple expansion, that it could be relevant, but it's not relevant in the world we're in, in the sense that we want companies that have organic growth of their free cash flow and then organic growth of the dividends they're paying from that free cash flow. And so I think that the, the yield level indicates the disinflationary pressures that are in the economy. Um, and that's in the COVID moment, but it was in every moment of the economy since the financial crisis. Uh, it, it got exaggerated last year, but it was no different. We basically have downward pressure on bond yields and we have an entire generation of investors that want cash flow. And they probably don't want one or one and a half or even two and a half percent reels on their cash it's more like four five six before they really are getting what they're looking for kevin I'll go back david with your views on inflation um kevin we're gonna ask you first um and i'm just gonna mention one thing that i read very recently about uh, inflation views basically i'm saying that it's uh you know, the, the pressure on the yield curve and the pressure next to one trillion dollars is going to be reflected in inflation and as I was reading it, I was wondering, well, what about the last trillion dollars? It's not the next 1.9 that's the only impact. The last four or five trillion is um, is the base load, and there's another 1.9 coming. So, um, Kevin, what are your thoughts? And I know what you've, you've told me already, but tell me what you've done with your family trust allocation and what your thoughts on inflation, perhaps inflation first. Well, you know, I, David's right. I'm, I'm sort of on the client side of this. I distribute 6% of our trusts each year. And so the traditional model was 50% uh, fixed income and 50% equities. Now, and, you know, we've been in this mode for decades. Um, and the, the core of any trust uh, fixed income portfolio was always a ladder of government bonds. And for a long time, you know, you sort of had a four or five handle on those, even more. Uh, but now, uh, when you bogey is 6%, and I look at all the different credits that we own, we own corporates, we own factoring, we own prefs, uh, converts, um, all kinds of bank loans, and that whole portfolio is, is generating between 2.4 and 2.6, depending on the month, 
and that's investment grade. So it's over 300 basis points off the bogey of six. So it's not very attractive. It's not interesting. I find corporate credits way overpriced. And so I'd rather own the company um, that is issuing those credits and not have duration risk. And also, and in some cases, get up to 200 basis points of yield in the form of a dividend and have some pricing power in, in this, what could be potentially um, in inflation. And, you know, I, I think the 10 year will have a, a two on it by the end of the year for various reasons. I could be wrong, but it's still not competition for equities until it gets past 3% in my view. Uh, the problem with the, the, the money coming in from the government, the 1.9 trillion and the, the 800 billion still not spent is I've learned through the PPP loans that I have seen go to my portfolio companies that 50% of that is completely wasted. It's a worthless spend. Um, it's going to companies that will never survive regardless of how many loans they get because consumer preferences have changed or whatever. And so it's very unproductive and that, that slows productivity. And so when you keep pouring money and making the, the economy less productive, strange outcomes occur. And that could be a run on the 10 year uh, past two. I don't know. I mean, th these loans to, uh, these are incredibly uh, poorly targeted. It's a very blunt instrument and, very, very wasteful. So I, I'd argue that maybe 40% of it is productive. The rest is a complete waste of money. David, share your views on the, the money out of Washington, whether it's the Fed or Congress or White House. In the what, do you, what do you think of the amount and the targeting of it? Well, it's interesting because I, I agree with Kevin, but I actually think it's far worse because he's referring to the unproductivity of some of the PPP loans and, and the potential for zombie companies that are receiving money. And that's still at least in the category of the more productive side of the distribution. When you go to the $1,400 direct payments to people that are already gainfully employed, that's to me as wasteful and non-targeted and blunt instrument as it gets. So I totally agree with Kevin. I suspect he agrees with me. It gets worse from there, not better. Now, there are certain parts of what they did with the Initial Cares Act that I think has proven to be productive. It's really difficult with private sector companies when you're doing a pandemic forced one instrument to identify zombie companies. And yet I do agree that there's an awful lot of this money that's going into a black hole. What I don't agree with is that that is necessarily inflationary because I think it is being offset by the debt deflation um, negative feedback loop, uh, very similar to Japan's problem for, for several decades. And I think that is, represents the secular story. We can talk about cyclical stories within it, but I think that we are living in very much a Japanification type story with a lot of differences. And most of those differences play to our favor. You know, we do have a more productive economy. We do have superior demographics. There are other aspects that are better, but what we have in common is a government that spends out of control, similar to European Union, similar to UK, Japan. And when you take that story here in the US, we don't have to speculate anymore what it means to bond yields. We can, we, we can debate and disagree as to why, but there's no disagreement as to what it's done. It's done nothing but push bond yields down for almost 40 years. So I think that there's some very low level which bond yields end up settling. I totally agree with Kevin. It could go to a two handle by end of the year. But again, you're not talking competition to equities until at least a three handle. And even then, in addition to the pricing power and the vertical mobility of the stock price, the other piece I would add is the growth of the income itself. It's not just that your principal can't grow with bonds, it's that the income can't grow. And so to be able to get both into one instrument is, albeit a different risk profile, is the superior nature of dividend growth equity. So I wanna to get to the dividend growth, but one more question about this money from Washington. So you both agree with the policy, there's too much money being, it's called not even directed to the right places. We do it investor. We're not changing the policy because it, it just got but anyhow. So what do you do, David, as an investor to adjust to this policy that you think is not well, not well designed, but it's coming? What are you doing about it? Well, uh, besides that week back at the end of March when they first passed CARES Act and there was still really significant left tail risk in the market, the market has not cared about stimulus or not doing stimulus ever since that moment. 
They began talking about a second stimulus package in July, and it didn't happen all the way till the last day of December. And in that six month period, the market was up four or 5,000 points. And even as we look at this 1.9 trillion now, you could have some talk about it coming down, going up. Market is responding to what is a free flow of credit out of monetary policy, low interest rates. I think it's a bigger uh, impact to the economy that they are not doing more targeted and more productive use with this money. But I think the market is totally past that. It's looking to corporate profits. And I don't think that the stimulus has anything to do with corporate profits. Do you think at this stage, the, the pullback in the markets is um, the beginning or is it near the end of this recent pullback? Well, we must be talking about the NASDAQ because the Dow is up 1,300 points in the last four weeks. So I wish all pullbacks could look like this. <laughs> well, things get expensive at too hard to buy. So pullbacks are, in many ways, a better time to put money to work. Investors are, are in it for the five, 10 plus years. Um, so let's just talk about the income. And... Um, Dividends and dividend growth are at the core of it. I mean, Kevin's been talking dividends and dividend growth and dividend quality, and that quality word is so embedded in what we do. Kevin, you know, just bring a real world perspective for people what quality really means when you're looking at companies and stocks and, and dividend paying stocks. You know, if you, I don't own the S&P 500 because that's a market cap weighted index and there's many companies inside those 500 that are broken for various reasons, particularly coming out of the pandemic or for policy reasons. I don't particularly like what's happening to the oil companies, which used to be core holdings for me because the incremental buyer is going away. We see the mandate coming out of BlackRock and CalPERS and, you know, it's been a great trade for the last few months as oil has spiked past 60. but. I think those stocks will be down by the end of the year because PEs get compressed when institutions take the sector off the weighting. And so we know CalPERS is reducing, um, in fact, maybe eliminating uh, hydrocarbon stocks, and that's bad. And the same thing's having with Sovereign. So, you know, you have to kind of, you have to test for quality, and that would be return on assets. You care about volatility. You, ver you care about stability of cash flows. Is the business model broken? Um, all of those things matter. Uh, liquidity, obviously, but for core holding for me, I own a subset of USA. And obviously, I'm talking my own book when I say this because I've certainly had a hand in forming the company and I'm an owner of the indexing because I care about what my trusts own. That's our biggest weighting. It's 40%. So I'm remember my bogey is 6% and I'm not really trying to beat the market. I'm trying to preserve capital and distribute 6% year in, year out, a decade in, decade out. And so you really want to have an eye on quality. And, and usually the S&P 500 is your anchor. It's the core. But I also have 20% in the Russell 2000, but not the Russell 2000 index because two thirds of those companies make no money and have abysmal return on assets. And yet you can find a couple of hundred, uh, you know, 10% of them that you should own. And you apply the same rules that OUSA applies to the S&P 500. You get 200. You kind of mine 200 names from 2000 names that you would own. And that's OUSM. That's a 20% weighting. I also recently raised Europe to um, 20%. Again, using the same rules, you find 50 stocks in Europe that are in Switzerland, the Eurozone in England. And so British pounds, Euros and Swiss francs, all dividend paying um, quality names, trading in some cases at significant discounts to their peers in the US. And yet everybody knows Nestle, everybody knows Roche, everybody knows American tobacco. So you can own those names and, and in many cases, half their sales are in the U.S. anyway, so why not own them? And, and get some exposure to uh, currency diversification because the U.S. dollar, I don't know, you put another trillion nine, you print it, and you start to ask why is Bitcoin doing what it does or you know, when is gold going to move? At some point, the, the amount of paper, it's not like we're Venezuela, but it's, it's not feeling as tight as it used to. I can certainly say that. So Kevin touched on some of the rules that are in OUSA, which basically are rules or scores for profitability using ROA, David, using cash flow to, to debt for balance sheet quality, dividend, dividend growth is uh, two of the additional dividend quality metrics. And um, it does result in about 100 stocks. And here's some data that's kind of interesting. S&P 500 has about 400 stocks. And last year, 23% of that, they're dividend. 
and OUSA avoided almost all of them. Uh, you have your own metrics for what stock would include in a client portfolio. Why don't you share what you can with people, your stock selection, stock uh, allocation methodology? Well, it's very much focused on quality. So it sounds like there's a lot of overlap in our in our philosophy. We tend to run more concentrated. Um, it would be very rare that we would ever have more than 30 stocks in the portfolio. But our focus is on the history of dividend growth and then our qualitative assessment of the sustainability of the dividend growth. It requires a hefty look at balance sheet, at the debt profile, at cash flow generation, and the cyclicality of the business model. Um, I've heard Kevin talk enough about this to know that we have a lot of alignment in the way we view it. Um, and, and we did avoid all the dividend cuts that took place in the market last year. And you're right, that 60 to 70 dividend cuts in the S&P 500 was the most since the financial crisis. Um, the, the area that I'm really intrigued by is the, the non-U.S. dividend growth. And Kevin mentioned some of these, these really fantastic franchises that exist outside the U.S. I think there is a lot of great dividend growth opportunity. It's something that we don't run at, directly at Bonson Group, so we rely on an outside manager, product, or solution. Um, I'm not convinced that the euro is in any better health than the dollar is. I think that's the really fascinating thing about global currency is by any metric, whatever we can say negative about one can be said about another. And so that sort of race to the bottom dynamic is quite alive and well. But taking currency out, I do agree that there are fantastic enterprises that meet the criteria that we would want to see for sustainability of dividend outside the U.S., but we've tended to focus more U.S. Or sometimes you might have a company, GlaxoSmithKline is an example, that does a significant amount of U.S. sales. It has an ADR that trades in the U.S., so we will own it even though it's technically domiciled overseas. But there's just a lot of great companies out there that are focused on cash flow generation, and, and that's uh, our philosophy. Well, we will laugh to be happy to share some uh, info with you on OEUR. It's uh, 50 stocks selected for the criteria that I mentioned, the profit building audit, the cash flow, the debt for balance sheet, and the dividend growth, dividend cover. And for sustainability, we look for a little bit more. We want stocks or companies that are able to grow the dividend. So you get the right. quality of the business and the history of growing the dividend, sustainability and, and income growth. And uh, we would definitely like to see those. Um, the simple math for people who are percent today, and if, and if the dividend keeps growing at 10% a year, which an average across the OUSA portfolio is about, right? Um, you double your income every seven years. That's rule of seven. People probably know that one. So nice to double your income as dividend growth rather than with bonds where there's no dividend uh, growth, of course, no income growth, just hoping that the reinvestment date is one at which you can, you can store your income as opposed to see it get cut. So um, you look at equity income risk, uh, David, I mean, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a category under the bus because I don't think anybody it anymore. MLPs uh, used to be the darling of super income assets and... Um, and then the tax law changed and companies were basically converting back to corporations and you know, the oil producers that were in the MLP bucket started to essentially get out of that. Plus, they had pressure on their business models and everything else. Um, so there's an example of a high income strategy that didn't work super well for people. I'm not going to ask you to comment on that. I want to put the marker out there for people to realize that high income can be very dangerous. What do you think are the dangers in the equity income market today? Well, I definitely agree with you and I have a whole chapter in my book about how high yield is different than growth of yield. And, and in fact, very often, not always, the very high income payers are called future dividend cutters. And so we don't, we don't think that a stock that is paying 5% when it's at $100 and the stock drops to 50 and so you say, oh, look, we have a 10% yield now is exactly attractive. It's called an accidental high yielder, but we don't like that. Now, I will defend the MLP space a little bit in this sense. If one focused on only the highest quality names and forget whether it's an MLP or a corp and was only focused on oil and gas pipeline companies 
the fact of the matter is that from the highest quality of names, EPD, which is still an MLP, Enterprise Product Partners, Kinder Morgan, which is a C Corp, they have maintained that dividend and in fact continued to grow it, um, but there's been quite a ride with the stock prices. But I think that those, like any other CapEx sensitive sector that get ahead of their skis in leverage are at risk of cutting dividends. And you saw that in mass with an awful lot of those MLPs. We avoid those high yielders that are at risk of dividend cuts by looking at the free cash flow generation and frankly, the C-suite stewardship of the balance sheet. Most of these people are psychopaths. They will lever up their company balance sheet at a whim. And, and we do not think M&A is a hobby and most of corporate America does. And I'm just being very candid. The companies that are the best stewards of shareholder capital are the ones that are returning shareholder capital in a responsible way in the form of dividend payments. And so I look to those types of companies. There are some higher yielders that might fit in there with a five or six handle, but generally in this environment, when you start seeing eight and nine handles, it often means there's something wrong with the company with maybe one or two exceptions. I, I'm gonna ask Kevin about a yield category and then I'll ask for you for your counter or comments on it. Real estate, REITs, et cetera. Kevin, what are your views on the different categories of real estate? Well, you know, it's a great question because um, I, use, I, I used to have a 31% weighting in, in our uh, trust portfolios in, uh, in real estate. Um, it's now been removed down to eight, and we actually own physical buildings with yield, obviously, uh, and, and used REITs as well, uh, even a hotel in Boston for a while. I, I, I mean, the problem now with commercial real estate is I don't know where the cap rates are going to end up. I know with certainty that uh, in my own portfolio companies, we are reducing um, – our, our demand for square footage because our in, in the areas of compliance, logistics, and accounting, those are the people that used to work in, in uh, you know, the pods, the booths in the basement. They don't want to do it anymore. They want to stay at home where they've been working for the last year. So in, in, major, in major states like New York and um, Florida, where I am now, and Texas and California, we're, we're, we're negotiating reduction, uh, in some cases litigating, uh, to get out of those leases. Um, so that's going to be a pressure point. And even AAA office, you know, uh, even in Boston, my own law firm is eliminating one floor uh, from their use of a AAA office. Uh, you know, for, I think that thing traded last at a 4.2 cap. My bet is the next time it trades, it'll be a 6 cap. So I don't want to be in front of that. Uh, and, and I think that's one problem. And the other thing is I don't like duration risk if uh, yields are going to, are going to run. REITs, uh, if they're involved in commercial real estate, and utilities, or even you know, pref, pref shares, perpetual prefs, they're all really bad assets uh, during a period where the trend is not your friend on rates. And so I don't want to own those. You know, and it's, it's really put me in an interesting situation because I've raised a lot of cash here, which, which is worthless. There's no yield on cash. You know, when, pe when people say to me, cash, I mean cash. I don't buy money market funds with all kinds of crap in them. I don't know what it is. I have cash and cash yields nothing. So I have to find ways to deploy that. Um, and it's a really interesting time. It really is. You know, it, it's, it's trying to find where you can get value, protect yourself against inflation, have some pricing power. But these old Bullworth, Stallworth, you know, the real estate used to be, any trust would be happy to get a 5% yield off a AAA office tower. Well, I think that's risk now. I really do. And, you know, it, it's, it's the, in this whole trend changing. So, um, you know, Dave is identifying it in different ways when he talks about, you know, um, what's occurring here in, in terms of, of getting some kind of increase in cash flow. You're not going to get that out of a bond. Well, guess what? You're not going to get that out of a building when everybody's leaving. Like, it's not like you've got pricing power as a landlord when half the place is empty, which is we'll, pretty we'll get, well. So let's get, let's get David's comments on this. I'll throw in one thing that I've learned recently. A partner of one of the major uh, brokers says that... Across the board, their blue chip clients are planning an average reduction in of 30%. Factor that into your thinking. <laughs> news, not news, David. What do you think about the different categories of real estate and REITs, David? 
I would place any bet, any size bet with anyone who will take the other side that they will not reduce their office footprint 30%. But I do think until the economy is more open, it's pretty understandable why the psychology and the emotion will lean that way. Um, I, I am total agreement that you don't ever want to step in front of a train. Um, when you're talking about the publicly traded REIT space, I think the bulk of the dynamics that Kevin's talking about are pretty well priced in. We don't own any office REITs. I, I wouldn't be looking to take a position from a dividend growth standpoint, any of the office REITs, but I do believe, and it sounds like Kevin may disagree with me here, but I, I don't think any of us know for sure. I do believe that the um, death of the office narrative is wildly overstated. I think at the end of the day, once we're actually allowed to get our lives back and there is a sort of resumption of normalcy, I think as much as a lot of people are enjoying the staycation of working from home in their Lululemon pants, I think a lot of people are going back to work. And I think that the, that the office climate, the office sort of culture didn't come from nowhere. I think that there is a certain embedded benefit, um, but but per, perhaps I'm wrong. Either way, the cyclicality of office rents has been true forever. And there's always been a certain kind of seasonality to the ebb and flow there. I would make an argument for buying the office space unless you're really getting that dynamic priced in. But I do think when you look at some of the other spaces in hospitality, Kevin mentioned owning a hotel in Boston. I think we own a, 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 are part of ownership of a lot of hotel projects around the country. Um, I think there's some very, very exciting opportunities there as the economy reopens. And I think when you look to the higher quality shopping mall space, whether it's Brook Street or the name we own, Simon Property, so many of those dynamics got priced in. And what people forget versus the great financial crisis, these guys entered the GFC with 80% loan to value. They entered COVID with less than 50% loan to value. There was a lot less leverage and a lot more protective equity that changes the overall dynamic from a capital structure standpoint. And some of these malls actually do have prime locations. I read recently of one that's converted to a, a uh, single story, massive corporate headquarters. Yeah. But, so away from real estate, let's talk to you. Closing comment, uh, first from David, then from Kevin. What historically has been the typical asset allocation for your moderately high net worth clients, not the extremes? What typical asset allocation and where are you now relative to typical? And then well, share, again, and share, share with people a little bit of the fun facts of how you allocate uh, wealth. Yeah, so uh, when you're talking about a, a typical moderately wealthy client, we do believe in custom portfolio management. We're not going to take uh, a client that just because they have the similar size portfolio as another client and allocate them the same. Their own liquidity need, you know, Kevin mentioned a 6% withdrawal rate from his trust. Some clients might need 4%, some might need 7%. So we have to look to the cash flow generation need. The, certainly the risk profile, uh, tax sensitivities. But once we're done kind of customizing a whole situation, I would say that our average uh, allocation for a kind of moderate risk profile ends up being something in the range of 50% in dividend equity and about 20% in various aspects of fixed income, whether it's really boring bonds or more credit sensitive bonds. And then there's other types of growth enhancement equities we might own, emerging markets, small cap, and then certainly uh, alternatives, more illiquid, private equity, direct investment that rounds that out. But that 50%, give or take 10% of core dividend growth, that's still always the building block of an asset allocation for us at the Bonson Group. Very interesting. And, and somewhat similar to Kevin's uh, description, in the large cap dividend, quality dividend growth, 20% in the U.S. small cap, mid cap, OUSM dividend growers. Um, so that's great. Uh, and last question, what's the sort of the, the scenario, David, that you have in mind? And then Kevin, I'll ask you the same as a closing comment. What do you think the market has not yet priced in that uh, has high potential to occur before year end? Earnings upside surprise Q4. That's what I think happens. I think it's going to be volatile, but, you know, again, just using my own um, private companies as an index, 
the upside surprise is coming from the productivity they're realizing by selling the majority of their sales direct to consumer at 100% gross margin, less uh, manufacturing costs and less customer acquisition costs, which is significantly higher free cash than what they were making selling it through Amazon or through retail. And you multiply that by the S&P 500 where you see that same trend manifest itself at Nike where they achieved in a matter of five months what they thought would take six years. They're almost at 50% direct to consumer um, sales of sneakers worldwide at 100% gross margin less manufacturing costs. So they don't really need that mall anymore. They don't need Foot Locker as much anymore. Uh, and the consumer is far more convenienced than changing their buying habits. And so when you look at, you know, this represents a very large 60% of the economy I'm talking about here, and it's happening very, very, very quickly. And the companies that are empowering that are the ones that everybody never heard of, the Zooms and the Shopify's and the CrowdStrikes and the Adobe's and the uh, Wix.com and all these, these behemoths growing at 40% globally. These are incredible uh, productivity generators never seen before. And so I, I think the economy is in great shape and um, not so much if you're a, you know, a, a, a movie theater in a C-grade mall. Okay, that's over. Bed Bath & Beyond, close 200 stores, more malls. You know. And I, I, you know, to a certain extent, I agree with David that you know, it's probably priced in, but I'm so glad that I exited that space in March um, because there's a lot of capital needed to turn an old retail mall into something useful today or a bed, bath and beyond box into, you know, climate controlled storage for pick and pack or cloud kitchen, whatever it is. But I say there, there's exciting opportunities, but, but I just think the economy is going to be so stimulated by this helicopter money and consumers getting free cash. You're making $80,000 and the government gives you more like, not only is that stupid, but just think about what it does in terms of, of just so unnecessary. But having said that, I want to sell that. I have stuff to sell to those people. <laughs> I'm going to be I'm going to be doing that. And so I'm, I'm extremely bullish um, on the on the back end of this year. And I think we'll surpass 7 percent GDP. And so you got to position yourself ready. It, it's it's not downside surprise. I think it's upside surprise that you melt up the old melt up story. So the consumer is going to have cash, the margins for direct to consumer type companies, your private companies, public companies, Nike and so on. Uh, we'll see margin expansion along your thesis there. I will make a one word plug about OGIG. Samantha, just put it on the screen where people can get information on it. It uh, is a portfolio that owns a lot of the companies Kevin just mentioned that have this uh, direct to consumer enabling for the corporates, the companies that want those business to business services to e-commerce enable their businesses. So David, I'll get you give you the closing word here. What are your what's your comment on the kind of thing that is not priced into the market that has a good shot at occurring before year end? Yeah, it's a really great question. I think that there's a lot of things that you could be considered, but I want to narrow it to kind of just one or two. And I'm in the pent up demand camp. It sounds like it's a similar thing to what Kevin's describing. Uh, I really think people are massively underestimating how cooped up a lot of people are. And I don't just mean that as consumers that want to go out and buy a toy, that they want to you know, get this extra money and go out and buy some new Nikes or buy a new handbag. I think it's experiential. I think people want to get on an airplane and go take a trip and then they want to take another one. And so it isn't so much that I want to go buy cruise lines or airlines because of that. I'm making an economic forecast that the overall ecosystem of the economy, because this impacts industrials, it impacts energy, impacts consumer. I think that there is a pent up demand that is wildly underestimated. Um, but the, by the end of the year, I think we will be speaking with more of a post pandemic vocabulary. And a lot of the things that people assumed were gonna be new normal are gonna prove that the old Ecclesiastes adage is right. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> Well, humans are humans, and we'll probably uh, want to do the things we've been doing for the last few decades or centuries. We think Zoom's going to survive, and these kinds of meetings are going to survive because we get to do a lot more of it. We get to meet you just at, at a quick click, and it's uh, an efficiency gain and uh, gives content to the audience of advisors and investors that we were able to reach today. David, I really appreciate you joining us, and i um, glad that people joined us and learned about your firm and your philosophy a lot of it overlaps with ours. Thank you very much for joining us. Kevin, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, hope the sharks in Miami are doing well. 
and uh, we'll see you again soon. Nice working with you, David. Thank you. Likewise, Kevin. Enjoy the time very much. Thank you. Thank you.